Now, I want to return to the subject of energy. I know we cover it a lot on the show, but we need to remember that the key way that Australia's manufacturing and energy-intensive industries remained competitive until recently was our dirt-cheap power prices that were able to offset Australia's comparatively high wage costs. But now it seems it's all over. Australia now has some of the world's higher power prices, even though we sit on some of the world's best, highest quality, most efficient and most clean coal, gas and uranium resources. Instead of using these commodities to produce cheap baseload power like the rest of the world, we've got a government that's hellbent on having us rely on weather-dependent, often Chinese-made, foreign-owned wind and solar farms that drive up power prices, destabilise the grid and aren't anything remotely resembling recyclable. Joining me to discuss this and much more is Liberal National Senator for Queensland, Matt Canavan. Matt, welcome to the show. Australia is diving right into the deep end of the net zero agenda. And yet around the world, there's a growing backlash against the rising cost of renewables. It's got many countries turning to nuclear, gas and even back to coal. For instance, over 90% of global GDP has net zero targets, but only 10% that were happy to sign up have detailed plans in place for how to get there. What does that tell us about what's going on? Well, well, Amanda, I, I said some time ago that net zero is dead, uh, and uh, now it's now it's really is one of those uh, Monty Python parrots uh, pining for the fjord, fjords. You know, it's absolutely carked it. It's uh, left this world. It's deceased. Uh, the net zero agenda never really took off in any significant way. Lots of flowery statements and um, grand promises to be delivered in uh, decades hence, conveniently well after the polit politicians' careers would have ended. Who are making these promises, but there's just never been any country that's taken it really seriously. I mean, even those countries in Europe which were the most committed uh, to the net zero agenda themselves have walked away from it so quickly. Uh, uh, Germany in the past year has reopened 24 coal-fired power stations. Most other European countries have had to do the same. And of course, the countries that just paid lip service to it, like China and India, well, they're just building coal-fired power stations like it's going out of fashion. Yeah. Perhaps the only country in the world that seems to be taking it somewhat seriously is, uh, unfortunately, us uh, down here in Australia, accounting for just over 1% of the world's emissions. Uh, we have a government that seems steadfast uh, on pursuing this insanity, regardless of what other countries do around the world, and, and uh, completely ignoring the, the terrible impacts it's going to have on our wealth, our prosperity, and, and ultimately jobs for Australians. And even if you accept that we have to do our bit as Australians, our proportion of emissions is so small that it wouldn't make a difference anyway. Matt, the intergenerational report says higher temperatures will impact labour productivity and require us to work differently. It smells like it's got unions yeah. having their hand on the pen. Tell us about that. Well, look, who knows what's going to happen in the future? I, I agree with uh, Yogi Berra that uh, predictions are very difficult, especially when they're about uh, the future. And, and, and I, I don't know what's going to happen in terms of natural disasters, the temperature of the globe. No one really does. What we should do is have proper systems in place that uh, potentially can be, can, we can adjust quickly and easily uh, to any change in the climate, like we have for the past 100 years. I mean, all, for all the... Uh, the hand-wringing about natural disasters, there's very little evidence that they actually have increased in recent times. And what has definitely changed is over the past 100 years, there are 98% fewer fatalities around the world from natural disasters. Most of that reduction is thanks to the use of fossil fuels, thanks to the use of concrete and, and, and machines uh, and energy that's been able to us to harness the climate and protect ourselves from it. So regardless of how the climate changes, I'm very, very confident that we will be able to adjust to it and we should focus our efforts on that. So, for example, why aren't we doing more, uh, mm. more backburning uh, in preparation of potentially more, more bushfires? Instead, we're doing the opposite. Why aren't we building more dams in preparation of potentially longer dry periods? Again, instead, we're doing the opposite. So I don't think sometimes people really, the, the climate change alarmists, take their own views that seriously because they're not putting in place the mitigating efforts that would actually uh, reduce the impact of their warnings. What they're really doing is they've got a broader agenda, as you suggested here, for the unions to get their piece, uh, for researchers to get their money out of us, and for some of them, more malevolently, trying to deindustrialise Western societies. 
I do think there is an agenda for that. And the observation you make about the weather is, is correct. Environmental Progress, a journal that deals with these matters, looked at it closely and said that there are fewer fires um, in the present time than we've had at any time in the past, and they are less deadly, uh, less severe and less damaging than at any other point in history. So you're quite on the money there. Um, now to far north Queensland, where opposition is mounting to Arc Energy's proposal to build a massive wind farm adjacent to World Heritage listed rainforests in North Queensland. There's really nothing green about this, is there, Matt? Well, the biggest problem with green energy is it's not green. The biggest problem with renewable energy is its impact on the environment. Uh, because uh, energy sources like wind, this is wind farm, Chalumban wind farm, aren't very uh, dense, they take up a huge amount of land and therefore they have a massive environmental footprint. So you have this ironic situation where those who are most uh, proudly and most loudly seeking to save the planet are uh, seeking to destroy the environment in the name of, of their cause. Uh, this wind farm up here is going to impact uh, the habitats, massive amounts of area of habitats of, uh, uh, of the Red Ghost Shark, of, uh, of, a, of a glider in, in, in North Queensland. Uh, I mean, I'm not the world's biggest greedy, but I don't want to see our beautiful natural landscape destroyed in this sort of way, especially when we have other alternatives. This wind farm is going to take up roughly, a wind farm of this size will take up about 15,000 hectares of land, uh, despoiling uh, that landscape. If we were to do nuclear energy, the same amount of power from this wind farm, a nuclear power station of that size would take up just 50 hectares. So I reckon the, the Red Ghost Shark, I reckon the sugar gliders of North Queensland, they'd be voting for nuclear energy if they had a vote. The little critters, they'd be, they'd be out there with signs and placards protesting in favour of getting nuclear power stations going so they can save their lives. But unfortunately, they don't have a vote. And too many people in our cities don't understand the impact uh, of these wind farms on our natural environment. They're anything but good for the environment. Senator Matt Canavan, thank you so much for your time tonight.